Okay, hello everyone. Let's start. Let me just share my screen. We got to the juicy parts of the course last time. We talked about Bitcoin. We talked about the blockchain protocol. We talked about the longest chain rule. But today I'm going to get into more details of Bitcoin and how things work. And actually, if you remember, we had to answer one really important remaining question, and that's how to create new units of currency. So where does money actually come from? Because remember, when we were talking about a centralized ledger, the idea was that the central bank could do two things that others could not. One was to create new units of currency, and the other was to create blocks and add them to the end of the blockchain. Now we have found a way to make the blockchain decentralized. We have mining, we have proof of work. Our blockchain is now decentralized, but we have not yet answered how we can create new units of currency. And actually another very related question uh, is about the miners. Why should anyone be a miner? So what are the incentives to be a miner? You see, I'm asking the miners to do a lot of work, right? So the idea is that the miners are going to solve this incredibly hard proof of work. And so the question is, why should anyone do it? I mean, on a higher level, we can even ask, why should anyone take part in this protocol in the first place? But I guess we can say that, well, people like to have a decentralized and online currency. So it's not too far-fetched to say that they're willing to just do a little bit of message passing and actually be a node in our network, right? But when it comes to mining, they have to actually spend a lot of money. They have to spend a lot of electricity doing the mining. So why should anyone mine? And actually we're going to answer both of these questions uh, with the same technique. And that's the idea of block rewards. So the idea here is that whenever a miner adds a block to the blockchain, they get some reward. And this reward is also how we are creating new units of currency. Okay. So I say that any valid block can include a payment to the miner. Can include, let's say, a transaction that has no inputs. So this is creating money uh, that didn't exist before. Uh, and let's say that this transaction has a single output that pays the miner. Okay. So if I add this extra condition here, and of course I have to fix the amount of the reward, so maybe I can say that the reward is some fixed amount. Maybe I can say that the block reward is, for example, 25 Bitcoins. Right, so this transaction that has no input, it actually has a single output, which is 25 Bitcoins and pays that to the miner. So if I have something like this, then again, Let's draw our familiar picture here. We have these different blocks. And let's say I'm a miner and I'm adding a new block. Now this new block, we said that it also contains a pointer to the transactions. And these transactions were saved in a Merkle tree. I can say that the very first transaction, uh, so let's say the transaction number one or zero, whatever, you can start counting from one or zero, has this kind of situation. It's a transaction 
it doesn't have any inputs, so nothing here, but it has a single output. And this single output is paying the miner. So the amount of this transaction is the block reward, let's say 25, 25 Bitcoins. And uh, so this is actually an output, right? So the transaction takes here 25 Bitcoins in this output and actually pays it to the miner. So it just includes the public key of the miner. If I do something like this, then the miners actually have an incentive to create new blocks and add them to the blockchain now. Because even though it's true that they have to spend a lot of time and money and computational resources to solve the proof of work problem, at the end of the day, when they're successful and when they solve it and add the block, they will get some reward. And this is also solving the other problem at the same time. So now I know how to create new units of currency. The only way that new units of currency are created are by the rewards that I'm giving to my miners. Okay, so both of these questions are solved at the same time with the same idea. Nice. Now, I have to tell you that in practice, the block reward actually uh, is not 25 Bitcoins. Uh, the block reward gets uh, reduced every four years roughly, and it gets cut in half. If you check right now, the Bitcoin block reward, uh, let me just Google it. I think it's 6.25 now uh, or something like that. Okay. Yeah, so Bitcoin has this uh, kind of weird rule. I cannot find the number now, but there, there is a fixed number of blocks and it says uh, every this many blocks, the block reward gets cut in half. So uh, right now uh, it, it started actually for uh, with a block reward of 50 Bitcoins per, per block. Now it's 6.25, uh, but we don't really care about that. Yeah. so. Uh, the number is actually 210,000. So in Bitcoin, the block reward, uh, gets halved after every 210,000 blocks. And 210,000 blocks is almost four years. So every four years, the amount of the reward actually goes down. And this is to just control the supply of the currency, make sure there is not an infinite amount of Bitcoins out there, no matter how much time passes. So actually, uh, the total number of Bitcoins in existence, the total number of Bitcoins can that can ever come into existence is bounded by almost 21 million or something like that. But yeah, this is just a peculiar thing in Bitcoin. Not every cryptocurrency has this. So what's important for us is that we just pay a reward to our miners because we have to incentivize them to mine. And the best way to incentivize someone to do something is to just pay them money. And this is also how we're creating new units of our currency. Okay. And again, right now, this is 6.25 Bitcoins. Now, this is the first part, but if you think about it, I now have miners who have some incentive to solve the proof of work problem and actually add blocks. But what incentive do they have to add any transactions to blocks? Because Again, let, let's look at this system from the point of view of a miner. If I'm a miner, I'm actually making money by adding new blocks. But it doesn't matter what kind of block I add. 
I can just add empty blocks. So there should be something that incentivizes me to actually include transactions into my block. Okay, there's actually a good question in the chat. I will get back to that, but let me first cover this one. Uh, so here we answered the question of why should anyone mine? But now I want to answer the question of why should a miner mine a non-empty block? Because it seems it's a lot of work, right? So if I'm a miner, the simplest thing to do is to just create an empty block and always mine an empty block and get the block rewards. Well, this is the, far, the part where uh, we get to transaction fees. Remember when I told you that uh, for a transaction to be valid, the sum of all the inputs should be greater than or equal to the sum of all the outputs. So we had this, we knew that in every transaction, in every valid transaction at least, except of course, for this particular type of transaction, the sum of all the inputs is greater than or equal to the sum of all the outputs. Now, when I was talking about this, I said that you cannot create new units of currency, but you can burn some units. I don't care if you put in more money into your transaction than you take out. Now, actually in Bitcoin and in a lot of other currencies that are uh, following Bitcoin's example, the difference is paid to the miner. So the difference which is the sum of all the inputs in the transaction minus the sum of all the outputs is paid to the miner as a transaction fee. Okay. And when I say it's paid to the miner, it's paid to which miner? It's paid to the miner that actually includes this transaction in a block and adds that block to the blockchain. So this is the miner who adds, who adds this transaction to the blockchain. Of course, not every miner, just that particular miner who's adding this transaction to the blockchain can get transaction fees. So now a miner actually has an incentive to include your transaction in their block. And the incentive is that you're intentionally making your transaction so that the sum of inputs is more than the sum of outputs. And so that the difference is paid to the miner. I just realized I cannot spell this is difference okay now of course the more you pay in transaction fees the more likely it is that a miner would take your transaction and include it in their block so in practice uh, this leads to this nice point if you want your transaction on the blockchain faster you have to pay more if you want to add your transaction sooner to the blockchain, just pay more transaction fees. Because as the person who's creating the transaction, it's completely up to you how to make the transaction, how to form it. And so you're the one who's really choosing how much to pay in transaction fees. And if you want to somehow uh, make the miners notice your transaction sooner and put it on the blockchain sooner, you'd better pay them more. Okay. So this is the issue of transaction fees. Uh, 
But I have to also mention another detail here. And the other detail is that the size of every block is actually bounded. So in Bitcoin, each block can have a size of at most 1 million bytes. It's not exactly one megabytes, it's one million bytes. Okay, 10 to the power of six bytes. Now, why do I need to put a limit on the block size? The reason for this is that my block is going to be propagated using the gossip protocol. Right, so when the miner finds the block, we talked about how the miner can actually publish their block. And the way the miner published the block was that they would just give the block to some of their neighbors and the neighbors would uh, use the gossip protocol, send it to their neighbors and so on until the entire network knew about the block. Okay, so if my block is too large, it becomes really hard to run this gossip protocol. And I will actually have a lot of delay in my network. So I don't want that. I want to actually keep my block small. So I put a block size limit. And in this case, as I said, in Bitcoin, every block is at most 10 to the power of six bytes. So this means that the transactions are actually competing for a limited amount of space in the blocks, right? That's why you have to, uh, even pay more in transaction fees. So uh, every time that you're creating a transaction, you're actually competing with all the other transactions for the limited amount of space that there is in a single block. So a miner naturally wants to maximize their own payoff. And if a miner successfully mines a block, they're going to get the block reward anyway but they want to also maximize their transaction fees. So again, the best way to ensure that your transaction gets mined, gets added to the blockchain, is to pay more in transaction fees. Okay. And these days, I think a transaction would cost you something like 50 US dollars if you want to get it on the first block out there, but... Yeah, that, that's just uh, the economic part of it. And we're going to just keep talking about the computer science parts of the system. I, I don't want to really talk too much about economics. Okay. So we have these parts right now. Now let's go to the question in the chat. And this is a really nice question. The question in the chat is, what if the block created by the miner is not in the longest chain? Will the miner still get the rewards? The answer is unfortunately no. So here's the thing. You have a chain and let's say you have a fork. Let's just talk about forks in general. So let's say this is my blockchain. And at some point, my blockchain gets forked, which means that two miners find valid blocks at approximately the same time, right? And then we said that the other miners can choose which block they want to extend. And so let's say they're extending both of these until eventually one of the branches gets longer, okay? And we said that the longer branch is always the consensus branch. So the longest chain is the consensus chain. So this becomes the consensus chain. And everyone on the network drops these two blocks. So everyone on the network says, this is now the longest chain. We only believe in this chain. And then uh, the other miners will also only extend this chain, okay? Of course, here I'm assuming that everyone is honest. We have to analyze what happens when we have dishonest behavior. But if people are following the protocol, the protocol says always extend the longest chain. If there are several longest chains, you get to choose. But if there is only one longest chain, you have to extend the longest chain. And as a note, you only 
believe in the transactions that are in the longest chain. So now there are several issues here. Let's give this block some name. Let's call this one, I don't know, BN. And let's call this one BN plus one. Now the problem is that BN and BN plus one are no longer in the consensus chain. So what does this mean? This means that all the transactions that were in these blocks are now invalid. So a, a transaction or, well, not invalid, they're not uh, processed. The, a transaction is finalized if it's on the blockchain and uh, if it's on the consensus chain, actually. So the transactions in these two blocks, it's as if they were never mined, okay? So the transactions in these blocks that get out of the consensus chain in BN and BN plus one are not finalized. Now, what does this mean? Well, of course we said that when a miner creates a block, they can include a transaction that gives themselves some reward, right? But that transaction is in this block. And if this block is not in the consensus chain, then this transaction is also not in the consensus chain. So at the very least, we know that the miners of these blocks that are out of the consensus chain are not getting any rewards. So miners of BN and BN plus one get no rewards. Now, why is this? Because, well, the transaction that paid the miner of BN is in BN itself, but every node in the network has now reached a consensus on this chain, which does not include BN. So if the miner here tries to spend that uh, output, which was giving it some uh, rewards for mining BN, everyone else on the network would just say this is an invalid transaction. Everyone else would say this output does not exist. Okay, so that's the problem that happens here. If you mine a block and then uh, some other chain gets longer than your chain, you're losing all of your transaction fees. But a much more important point here is that if you have a transaction here, let's say you're not the miner. So let's say you're just someone who's accepting Bitcoin as payment. And you have a transaction, your transaction is in BN. That transaction no longer exists. That transaction is no longer finalized. So any transaction that is in BN or any output that is created in BN or BN plus one cannot be spent. So this doesn't apply only to the miners. It also applies to anyone who had their transactions here. Of course, if you have a transaction here and the transaction also appears here, then you're fine, right? But if your transaction is only appearing, let's say here outside the main chain, then that transaction has not happened. So any transaction outside the consensus chain is basically ineffective. It has no effect at all. It's ignored. Okay. Now this creates a problem, right? Because I want you to imagine this scenario. So we can have what we can again call a double spending attack. What's a double spending attack? A double spending attack is this. Let's say uh, I want to buy something from you and maybe you have seen, for example, Bitcoin based, uh, uh, Bitcoin based ATMs or Bitcoin based vending machines. 
So let's just consider a Bitcoin-based vending machine. Okay. So what happens with a vending machine is that I, I have to pay something. And as soon as I pay, the machine has to give me the item. Right, so there is no time to wait. So usually the way that a Bitcoin based vending machine would work is that it gives me a, its public key. So I have the, let, let's call it the merchant. Merchant provides their public key or their identity. And then uh, the customer creates a transaction paying the merchant. Right? And the customer gives this transaction to the merchant. And actually, it's usually the merchant who publishes the transaction, but of course, the merchant can verify that the transaction is valid. So the merchant verifies validity of the transaction. And if it's valid, The merchant does two things. First, they publish the transaction. And secondly, they just provide the item, provide whatever was bought. Okay. Now there is a problem here. And there are actually two problems that you can see already. There are two kinds of attacks that the customer can do here if we have a vending machine that works like this. So if I just have a vending machine that is connected to the internet, anyone can come and give me a transaction that pays me, and then uh, I give them the item immediately. Okay, so the first problem, or the immediate problem, or let me call it the first attack, is what I call an immediate double spending. So let's say we have, again, someone called Alice, and Alice is the customer here. And let's say she wants to uh, be malicious and do something dishonest. So here's the thing. Let's say there is a previous transaction and this transaction is on the blockchain. So this is a transaction on the blockchain. And let's say this is paying something to Alice. I don't know, let's say this is paying one Bitcoin to Alice. Okay, now of course one, one Bitcoin is too much, but don't care about the amounts right now. So what does Alice do? Alice creates a new transaction. Let's call this one transaction one and takes this one Bitcoin as an input to this new transaction and creates an output that is paying this one Bitcoin to the vending machine. Right, or to whatever uh, public key we have given her. And she gives us this transaction one. Now, at the same time, now, of course, this is not exactly one Bitcoin. This is maybe, I don't know, 0 0.99 Bitcoin because there should be some transaction fee as well. Now, let's say at the same time, she creates another transaction. Let's call this one transaction two. 
that spends the same coin that uses the same output as its input and pays 0 0.99 bitcoins back to Alice. Now, what she can do is that she publishes both of these transactions. She gives transaction one to our vending machine and our vending machine looks at this transaction, verifies that it's a valid transaction, publishes it and gives her the item. But at the same time, Alice is publishing transaction two. And maybe Alice is connected to different parts of the network. So maybe transaction one and our vending machine is happening in Hong Kong, but transaction two is somewhere, let's say in the US. And basically the idea here is that Alice is hoping that uh, the next miner sees transaction two before transaction one. And the miner actually includes transaction two into a block. And if the miner includes transaction two in the block, then this was a successful attack. So Alice got her item from our vending machine, but didn't actually pay for it. Okay. So this is what we have. If the miner includes transaction two in a block, then the attack was successful. And the problem here is basically that we are just assuming that as soon as we have a transaction, that transaction is, uh, is valid, of course, we're going to check the validity, but we're assuming that as soon as we're seeing a valid transaction that is paying us, we're actually paid. But that's not true because Alice can create another transaction and then there is some likelihood that this other transaction gets on the blockchain first. Okay, but Alice can actually do an even smarter attack here. So look at this, this transaction here, it's paying 0 0.1 Bitcoin in transaction fees, right? So when she's doing the double spending, instead of sending 0 0.99 Bitcoins to herself, maybe she can send 0 0.95 Bitcoins to herself. Now what happens? This transaction is actually paying five times as much in transaction fees. Okay. So now if you're a miner, and if you see both of these transactions, if you see transaction one and transaction two, you would prefer to include transaction two in your block, right? Because a miner just wants to maximize their own mining payoff. They, they want to maximize the amount of money that they make. So actually what's happening here is that Alice can bribe the miner into making her attack successful. So Alice can bribe the miner. to increase her chances. Okay. If I have a situation like this, again, if I'm a miner, I see two transactions. I see that transaction one and transaction two, they're doing double spending with respect to each other. They're both spending the same coin. So I know that I can include only one of these two transactions into my block. But if I have a choice, I would pick transaction two because this is giving me more in transaction fees. And that's exactly what Alice wanted because transaction one is actually paying the vending machine but transaction two is paying the money back to Alice. Okay. So what can you do if you are actually uh, the merchant? If you're a merchant accepting payments using Bitcoin? Let's say you're the person who's created the vending machine, or let's say you have a website, you're selling something online and you're accepting money in Bitcoin. Well, you have to at the very least wait for the transaction to actually get on the blockchain, right? So the solution 
the way we can avoid this kind of attack is to wait for transaction one to be added, to be mined, let's say. I, I use the word mined, but what I mean here is that wait for it until there is a block that contains this transaction and that block is mined and added to the blockchain. So whenever I say mined, I mean added to the blockchain. Okay, so that's the solution we have to avoid this attack. But now we have a second attack. And the second attack is based on a fork. So double spending in a fork. Okay. Let's say that you're cautious as the merchant and whenever someone does a transaction, you don't just accept the transaction, you actually wait for the transaction to get added to the blockchain. Now, of course, this has some problems and we will come back to it. It will not really work for a vending machine in the sense that if I have a vending machine, well, I, I want to give service immediately, whereas every block it takes roughly 10 minutes to be mined. So even using this solution, if I want to wait for the transaction to be added to the blockchain, I have to wait for 10 minutes. So this is kind of impractical. It's like you go to a vending machine, you pay, and then you have to wait for 10 minutes for your transaction to get added to the blockchain before the vending machine trusts you and gives you the item. So not great if you want to have a fast transaction. Of course, if you're buying something valuable online, if let's say you're buying a laptop online and it's going to take several days to send it to you anyway, this is fine. You can wait 10 minutes. Who cares? But actually, as we will see, there is an even stronger attack that can happen here. So here's the thing. Let's look at this from the point of view of the merchant. So uh, you are the merchant. What do you see? What the merchant sees? So first I see a transaction. I see transaction one that is paying me, okay? Now I say that when I see a transaction, of course it has to be valid. I see a valid transaction that is paying me. I'm still not going to trust this because maybe the customer is doing some double spending. So let's say this is my blockchain again. I'm going to draw this many times. So let's say this is my blockchain. And I wait until this transaction is added to the blockchain. So I wait until I see some block that contains this transaction, okay? So what I see, I, I wait a lot here. Well, not a lot, almost 10 minutes until I see a block in the blockchain that contains this transaction. Okay. But the problem with, with the blockchain is that it can fork. So maybe I'm unlucky, or maybe actually Alice, the, uh, the person who was paying me is herself a miner, and maybe she creates another block here. She creates a fork, or maybe I'm just unlucky and there is a fork. And then transaction two is put into this fork. And remember, transaction two was the transaction that is paying the money back to Alice herself. Now, again, this can be an attack. Maybe Alice is actually a miner, or maybe Alice is bribing some miner to do this. 
I don't know. Or it might just be an honest situation where a fork has happened because we said that forks can happen, they will be resolved eventually. But anyway, as a merchant, it doesn't matter whether this was actually an attack. What matters here is that now you're not very certain that you will be paid. So if your solution was to just wait for the transaction to be added to the blockchain, this solution is not enough here. Because it might be that as we continue extending the blockchain, maybe transaction two ends up in the longer chain. And if this happens, then my consensus chain would be this one. And if this one is my consensus chain, then uh, even though at some point I saw this transaction that was paying me was on the blockchain, it is now removed from the consensus chain. And so I'm not actually paid. Okay. So this is the problem. The problem is that some blocks can be reverted. And by reverted, I just mean it used to be in the consensus chain, but now it's no longer in the consensus chain. So some blocks can be reverted and this transaction, transaction one might be removed from the consensus chain. So basically, it's not enough for you to, if you're the merchant, it's not enough for you to just wait for your transaction to get added on the blockchain. It might be that even though my transaction is on the blockchain, at some point in the future, it gets removed from the blockchain. And now, we, when we were talking about the blockchain, we said that the blockchain has to be append only, right? We had we had this property that you could only add to the end of the blockchain. So this is now contradicting that. And yeah, there, there is no way we can really fix this. If you have a bunch of transactions that are in these blocks, and if a fork happens, what I was really focused on when I was designing my protocol was to make sure that the fork is resolved. Right, so I said that whenever a fork like this happens, we just want to make sure that eventually all the honest nodes reach a consensus about which branch they should take. And that happens because we had the longest chain rule. We said that eventually one of the chains gets longer and then everyone will follow the longest chain. But the problem is of course, what happens to all the transactions that were not in the longest chain where all of those transactions are basically ignored now. It's as if they never existed. So if you're a merchant and you're unlucky and your transaction is in this part of the chain, which is going to be ignored because there is a longer chain not including it anymore, then yeah, tough luck, you, your transaction has gone. Okay, now what is the solution to this one? What can I do to make sure this never happens to me if I'm a merchants well here's the thing you can have uh, forks like this but whenever you have a fork actually the two parts the two branches of this fork share the vast majority of the blocks right so this might be block number 10,000 and then I have a fork in block number 10,000 and one but then I reach consensus after two more blocks Right. So even though these forks make it so that I temporarily don't have consensus, I always have consensus about the prefix, right? I always have consensus about everything up to this point, everything from the left up until this point where there was a fork. And well, how long can this get? How long can this fork get? Honestly, in practice, it doesn't get too long. Very soon, I will have a situation where one of my branches is longer than the other branches. And then I say the longest chain is the consensus chain. Okay, so I don't expect to have a situation where I have a fork that like, let's say the fork happened here, and then I have 20 blocks 
uh, in each of the branches after the forks. That would not happen. That's the, the probability of that happening is very low. Of course, it's not completely impossible, but the probability is very low, right? Because imagine if I have uh, two forks like this, uh, it was already very, there was a very small probability that two miners find valid blocks at almost the same time. But then it should happen again. Again, two miners should find valid blocks at almost the same time, one extending this one and one extending this one. And then to have, to continue the fork, again, this should happen again. And well, the, the probability tends to zero, right? So it's very unlikely that when I have a fork, both branches continue for a long time. The branches will continue for only a short time before one of them gets longer than the other. So if I have something in my blockchain, if I have a block and let's say I already have a large number of blocks after this one, let's say uh, I have 10 blocks after this one, I'm pretty sure that there would not be a fork that reverts this particular block because my forks are always short, okay? So the solution is that we say, uh, we have to wait for confirmations, okay? And what is a confirmation? A confirmation is basically a block that is added after another block. So the idea is that if this is the block that contains my transaction, every block that is added after this block is considered a confirmation. So this block is basically confirming that at least from some miner's point of view, this block that I care about, let's call this one BN, I care about BN, right? As the merchant, because BN contains the transaction that paid me. So if another block is added after BN, this means that there was a miner who believed that BN was the last block in the blockchain, right? So this is kind of a confirmation for BN. And if another block is added after this one, this is a second confirmation. If another block is added, this is a third confirmation and so on, okay? Now, the idea is that if I have a lot of confirmations, it's now unlikely that I would have a fork that is here, that basically removes BN from my consensus chain because forks usually appear at the end of the chains. And when they appear, they die out after very few blocks, after two, three blocks, okay? So basically, if I have a large number of confirmations here, the more confirmations I have, the less likely it is that, my, that the block that I care about actually gets kicked out of the consensus chain, okay? So the solution is to wait for confirmations, and the standard, what everyone does is that they wait for six confirmations, okay? There's no reason for the number six, it's just a number that the community likes. So usually when you pay someone using Bitcoin, they will not only wait for the transaction paying them to get on the blockchain, but they will also wait for six confirmations. They will wait for six blocks to be added. And when six blocks are added, then they're pretty sure they can say, okay, th this has never happened before. It has never happened that we have a fork that goes six blocks deep. So I can be sure that uh, if I have six confirmations, then uh, this would stay on the blockchain. But now there is a problem. And the problem is again, uh, unfortunately with our, uh, runtime. So here we said that if I want to wait for my transaction to be added to the blockchain, I actually need to wait for almost 10 minutes, right? So waiting for 10 minutes because we said that every new block is mined roughly every 10 minutes. Uh, sorry, a new block is mined roughly every 10 minutes. So here, if I wanted to just wait for my block to be, for my transaction to be added to a block and to the blockchain, I had to wait for hopefully 10 minutes. But now I have to wait for almost an hour, right? Because I have to wait for this block to be added to the blockchain 
And then I have to wait for all these confirmations, five, six confirmations. And if I want to wait for all of these, it will take an hour. So now again, this is not great if you want to have fast transactions. If you want to actually have a vending machine, Bitcoin is not your friend. Uh, this would only work if you, you can get the payment and you can wait. So again, if you're a website that is selling a laptop online and then when you get an order, you have maybe two, three days to fulfill the order, then by all means, you can wait for these confirmations. Otherwise, this is just too slow. And so there is a trade-off. You should either accept that you, you might be attacked like this, or if you want to be almost sure with probability close to one that there is no attack, then you have to wait for a lot of confirmations. Okay, let me answer the questions in the chat. So one question is that will miners add the reverted transactions back to the mempool? Yes. So if you have a transaction that was here, actually that transaction can also be uh, in these uh, other parts of the chain as well. So let me see. If I have a fork like this, so remember when the miner is creating a block, the miner is trying to maximize their own payoff. So they're just trying to take transactions that are paying them a lot of transaction fees, right? So, and the miners are usually aware of the entire situation that is happening here because miners are usually rich, they're well connected to all parts of the network. So usually as a miner, you know very well what's happening and you know very well if there is a fork. Now, if there is a fork and you see a transaction here, Let's say, let me use a different color. Let's say I have a green transaction here, but let's say I'm the miner of this block. So I know that I'm extending this chain. So I know that the green transaction is not in my, my chain yet. So that means that from my point of view, I can basically consider the green transaction to be in my mempool and I can take the green transaction and I can put it in my, uh, block here and that's completely valid because when I create this block, if I successfully create this block, then there is no double spending because the double spending is only checked with respect to the same chain, right? So the these two greens, they're not in the same chain. So as a miner of this block, I can actually add the green transaction. and yeah, so it's actually a little bit more complicated. It's not that the miners keep just one mempool. You actually have to keep a separate mempool for every chain, right? Because if you remember, we said that when a transaction is added to the blockchain, it has to be removed from the mempool and also all the other transactions that are double spending uh, the same coins that uh, were spent in this transaction, they have to also be removed from the mempool. But if you have a fork, then you have different blockchains. So you have different mempools. So in effect, what's happening actually in the code of a miner is that they're keeping track of all of the uh, different uh, forks here, all of the different chains, all of the different branches. I have so many words for this. And then for every branch, they're also keeping track of a separate mempool. And of course, as a miner, they have to make a decision. They have to figure out, okay, which one of these branches do I think is going to be the consensus branch? Because I don't want to waste energy extending a branch that ends up uh, going out of consensus and not paying me any rewards. Right, so there, there is a lot of uh, really hard calculations that go into this, but as, as far as we're concerned, at the, as the users, let's say not as the miners, we don't really care about how the miners are doing these things. What we care about is that we follow the longest chain always. The longest chain is the consensus chain. And if I'm a merchant and someone is paying me, the way that I can really trust that payment is if uh, 
the payment gets added to the blockchain and then I see a lot of blocks confirming it so that I'm kind of sure that there would not be a fork that starts before this block BN and then erases my transaction. Okay. So another question in the chat is, how can the attacker make the exact fork? Isn't it very hard to do so? Well, yes and no. Here's the thing. Uh, well, first of all, it doesn't have to necessarily be an attack. It can be an, an honest case of a fork, right? So it can be that let's say I'm Alice, I want to buy something from you. And I see that there is already a fork in the blockchain. Maybe let me do it like this. Oops. Okay, let me just draw somewhere else. So maybe this is the situation. This was a block in the blockchain and there is a fork. And now here's what I do as the attacker. As soon as I see a fork, I say, this is a, a good opportunity for double spending. So as soon as I see a fork, I go to your vending machine and I create a transaction that pays your vending machine. Okay. And then I create another transaction that pays myself. And then I find, uh, I find out which part of the network is following this branch. And I publish my first transaction here. I find out which part of the network is more likely to follow this branch. And I publish my second transaction here. Now, what I'm hoping for is that the miner that is extending this one is putting transaction two in it. And the miner who's extending this one is putting transaction one. And then I'm also hoping that this one, the, uh, the branch that actually includes transaction two would get longer. Okay. So this is what I'm hoping as the attacker. Now, I don't have a 100% probability of success. Of course, it might be that the transaction that actually pays you uh, and was the honest transaction gets into the longer chain, but there is no way to guarantee that. And I have some probability of success, right? So if I'm an attacker and let's say I have a 50% probability of success or even 10% probability of success, I would try the attack because if the attack is successful, I've gotten an item for free and I haven't paid for it. If the attack is unsuccessful, I've paid for an item and I'm getting the item anyway, right? So there is no downside to this attack. Uh, so that's the first case. So it's not just that uh, I'm first double spending and then creating a fork. It can be that I'm seeing a fork and just opportunistically using it to do double spending. But another case actually, which is even more common here, is that if this item that I'm buying is worth really a lot of money, and if I myself am a miner, I just keep doing the mining and I have two transactions. I have transaction one, remember, that pays the merchant. And I have transaction two, which is the dishonest transaction that is paying the money back to myself, right? So let's say as Alice, I'm also a miner. So I just keep mining and I know transaction two. So I try to mine a block that includes transaction two. Okay. So at some point I find a, a valid block that includes transaction two. But when I find this block, I don't publish this block. I first come to you as the merchant and I show you transaction one. Okay. And you publish transaction one, so some other miner will add transaction one here to some block. But as soon as that happens, I was a miner myself, and I already had this fork ready. So I just publish the block that contains transaction two. And now we have a fork. And I have a 50% chance that this one gets to be the consensus in the consensus chain. So I have a 50% chance of actually 
being able to double spend. Of course, this only works if the value of the item is really high, because as the miner who's doing this kind of attack, I'm risking my block reward here, right? I'm not publishing this block, so I'm risking my block reward, and I'm waiting until someone else publishes this block. So when I do that, there is like a 50% chance again that I lose my block reward. But if the amount of money that I was double spending was much more than the block reward, then this makes sense. So yeah, there are many scenarios where you can have an attack like this. But again, as I said before, it doesn't really matter how the attack is done, even though I just went through a lot of scenarios to tell you how it can be done. But at the end of the day, if you're a merchant, you don't care why or how the attack happened. What you care about is that when a transaction is just added to the blockchain, you cannot really trust it. You have to wait for confirmations before you can trust it. Okay. Great. Now I'm going to talk about some more issues here, some more details of how Bitcoin works. One issue is the issue of the difficulty of the puzzle. So remember I said something like this. So let's talk about adjusting the difficulty. So I said this several times when I was talking about the previous attack, I said that in Bitcoin, A new block is mined almost every 10 minutes. Right? But how does this work? Because remember how proof of work uh, actually works? The, the idea there was that I have some threshold, I have some constant D, and I have to make sure that the hash of my block is less than D, okay? So this was my proof of work. It was to find a block. Of course, it has to be a valid block, like with all valid transactions, whatever. Find the block B such that the hash of B is at most some number D, right? But here's the thing. Let's say that I'm using a hash that has 256 bits. So let's say the that my hash function actually gets a string of any length and gives me a string of length 256, okay? And let's kind of assume uh, this is not a great assumption, but let's assume that H works like a random function or behaves like a uniformly random function. Okay. So if this is the case, then I have to say that I take my hash and I'm just trying different blocks, right? I had a nonce in my block that I could change. So I'm just trying different nonces. Now, what is my probability of success? What is my success probability if I'm a miner or Okay, instead of my, let's just write, what is a miner's success probability? Uh, if, let's say I try uh, some hash, okay? Uh, or if I try, or, if they try, let's say, K blocks. Okay, so if I just try K different blocks, what is the probability 
that I succeed in finding a block that has uh, a hash that is at most D. Okay. So every time I have a probability of just one over, uh, sorry, every time I have a probability of D over two to the power of 256 to be successful, right? So if I create some block randomly, this is the probability that I would succeed. And uh, I would actually get a block that has a hash that is less than or equal to D. So what if I try K blocks randomly? Well, I can just use a union bound or I can uh, find it exactly. So if I want to be very exact, the probability that I don't succeed after one try is one minus D over 252 to the power of 256. So the probability that I don't succeed after trying K blocks is this to the power of K. And the probability that I do succeed after trying K blocks is one minus this entire thing. Okay. But instead of this, I'm going to say that my probability of success, well, the first time I try a block, I have this much probability of succeeding. The second time, I again have this much probability of succeeding and so on. So my probability of success is more than KD over two to the power of 256 or something like that. Okay, so the exact value is this one, but I mean, it's not really an exact analysis anyway. This is hand wavy because my hash function is not really a uniform random function, right? But assuming that my hash function is behaving like a uniform random function, when I'm choosing my block uniformly at random, then I have this analysis. Okay. Uh, now, so I can have an estimate of how many blocks I have to try before I find a solution. That's my point. I can uh, use any of these two estimates to see what number K should I use so that with very high probability, I find a block, okay? Now, here's the thing. I can dynamically change my number D, okay? So I can see what happens. I can uh, actually make my problem harder or easier based on what's happening on my network. And again, I don't want to do the probabilistic analysis here. I just want to say this. I know that my proof of work is designed in this way. So I want to find a valid block such that the hash of that block is at most T. Now I can ask my miners to also include a timestamp in all the blocks. Okay, so let's say that all of my Bitcoin blocks have a timestamp. And it's really easy to have a timestamp because we have, for example, Linux time, which basically gives us the number of seconds that have passed since January 1st, 1970. And then uh, I can also tell all of my nodes that if you get a block and it has uh, a timestamp that is too far in the past, or if it has a timestamp that is in the future, just ignore it. Okay, so I can make sure that if the timestamp is manipulated too much, then the block does not get uh, propagated in my network at all. So I have a bunch of blocks and all of them have timestamps. The timestamp was chosen also by the miner. So maybe the miner actually didn't include a real timestamp. Maybe the miner uh, kind of changed the timestamp a little bit, but they cannot change the timestamp too much. So I can add some sanity checks. I can say that the timestamp of this block has to be after the timestamp of the previous block. I can also say that if you see a block and its timestamp is too far in the past, just ignore it. 
and so on. Okay, so based on this, I can actually figure out if my problem is too hard or too easy. So let's say that I look at the last, whatever, 1000 blocks, okay? So I take the last 1000 blocks, let's say this is my last block in my blockchain, and I look at the 1000 blocks that were here. And I can look at the amount of time that it took for each one of them to be mined. So I can look at the average time to mine a block. And that's easy. You just take a block and you, you look at the difference between its timestamp and the timestamp of its previous block. Okay, so I can say find the average mining time. So ideally, I want this average mining time to be a fixed value. I want it to be 10 minutes. Now, there are two cases. My first case is that this average mining time, let's actually give it a name. I'm going to call it T. Or actually, let me call it Mu since it's an average. So my first case is that my average is actually more than 10 minutes. If on average it's taking more than 10 minutes to mine a block, then it means I have to actually uh, reduce the difficulty of my proof of work, right? So my proof of work is too hard. My miners are struggling. Uh, there is not enough hash power in the network. Uh, they cannot really produce a new block every 10 minutes. So the average time for creating a block has become more than 10 minutes. So in this case, I would just say increase D. And increasing D actually decreases the difficulty. Right? So it decreases the difficulty of the proof of work. Now, another case is that I look at this and I see that on average, my miners actually took less than 10 minutes. And this is what really happens very often in the Bitcoin network. So what's happening in the Bitcoin network is that you have a fixed difficulty, but then more and more people come and invest in mining and they buy equipment for mining and they can now compute more hashes every second, right? So if you keep the same difficulty, you get new blocks sooner than once every 10 minutes. And so you have to actually increase the difficulty, which means that you have to decrease the threshold D. So you have to decrease D and you have to increase the difficulty. And of course, you can just use the formulas that we had there for the probability that they get it done in 10 minutes and you want that probability to, let's say, uh, be roughly 50% or I don't know, be roughly 90%. Let's say I want to make sure that with probability more than 90%, I get a block between nine minutes and 11 minutes after the previous block. So I can just adjust my difficulty D so that I achieve that, okay? So, and this is also a formula. And the formula is just hard-coded into the Bitcoin protocol. And the formula is actually different for uh, different currencies because they do different types of statistical analysis and different types of probabilistic analysis. So generally the idea is that this D, the difficulty is not a fixed thing it's something that actually changes. Now, you can design your own cryptocurrency and you can change it the way you like. The important point is that if you're seeing too many blocks, you have to increase the difficulty so that you see fewer blocks. If you're seeing too few blocks, you have to decrease the difficulty, okay? That's it. And the way you can understand whether your uh, system is working well enough or not, is that you just look at the last 1,000 blocks. Or again, this 1,000 is also an arbitrary number. 
you can fix some number in your protocol. You can say every 100 blocks, uh, everyone on the network computes a new difficulty or every 1000 blocks, everyone in the network computes a new difficulty based on what happened in the previous 1000 blocks. And then now if someone wants to add a new block, they have to follow the new value of the difficulty. Okay. So this is how we have a new block almost every 10 minutes. And yeah, finally, I just have to give you one more point here. I said that the longest chain is the consensus chain. Actually in Bitcoin, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but the difference is not really important in practice. So each one of these blocks had a difficulty, which means that uh, how difficult was it to find a block that had that particular hash? And actually, when we talk about the longest chain, we're talking about the chain that has the largest overall difficulty of mining. Okay. We're not talking about the chain that necessarily has the longest number of blocks. But again, that's a very minor detail. In practice, they're the same. So for all practical purposes, you can just assume that the chain that has the largest number of blocks is the largest chain, the longest chain. Okay, so a question in the chat is, what would the problem be if the average mining time would significantly differ from 10 minutes? Honestly, uh, 10 minutes is again, just an arbitrary number that the designer of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto chose. Uh, actually, the block times are different in different cryptocurrencies. For example, we will talk about Ethereum in this course and in Ethereum, the block time is almost 13 seconds. So you get new blocks much faster than you get them in Bitcoin. But the idea of choosing 10 minutes was that suppose I have uh, all of my nodes connected to each other over the internet, and maybe there is a lot of delay in the network. Maybe it takes time for everyone to see all the messages. Maybe the Gossip protocol takes time. So the idea was to let's just give them 10 minutes time so that we're sure everyone has seen all the blocks. Uh, but yeah, again, this 10 minutes, it's actually too long and it's one of the design flaws in Bitcoin, I think. So yeah, they could easily go with 10 seconds instead of 10 minutes. 